I am nervous for some reason. <laughs> You'd think this is like my first video ever. It's not, but it is the first video in this new space. If you are returning to my channel, then you know that I just moved. I just took a big leap of faith. I have relocated to a state that I had previously never been to before. I moved into a house that I had never seen in person before. <laughs> and if you're new to my channel and you're like, what is going on? What is up with this girl? Um, hi, <laughs> my name is Julie and on this channel, I share stuff and primarily I tend to share things about my journey in Christianity. I just find it so fascinating and it's really changed my life in ways that continue to foggle my mind and humble me immensely. <laughs> so if you're into that kind of thing or if you can relate, feel free to stick around. This video is gonna have some slightly mature themes that I'm gonna be discussing, so just keep that in mind if you have little ones around. Viewer discretion is advised. <laughs> so living with a partner, is it ever okay to do before marriage? So I'm just gonna tell you straight out the gate, the short answer is no. And if you are looking for someone to coddle you on this topic and you don't want to hear that because maybe you're in a situation where you are living with a partner, you have in the past and you don't want to feel judged or you're thinking about doing it right now in the present or in the near future, don't click off just yet. Um, I'm not coming at this from a holier than thou, perfect Polly Pocket <laughs> sort of perspective. In my 20s, which I'm about to turn 29 this year, in my 20s, I have lived with two different boyfriends in the past. So I have made this mistake before, and I it wasn't for short periods of time either. I lived with one boyfriend for three years, and I recently lived with an ex for a year and a half. So yeah, I am not coming at this from maybe the ideal Christian background, I guess you could say, because if you are familiar with my story, you probably know that I wasn't raised in Christianity or in any religion at all. And so I wasn't raised with these kind of Christian values. So for me, growing up in the secular world, which I think if you come from the secular world, you can probably relate to this, it was pretty much normal to live with a boyfriend or a girlfriend. It, it's almost kind of expected. It's almost kind of the, the progression of things. I feel like there's this kind of rhetoric in, in the secular world of, well, how could you even marry someone if you've never lived with them? I mean, how could you even really truly know them without seeing their quirks and their habits and their personality day in and day out? So... I thought it was normal and I didn't really see anything wrong with it and I have lived to tell a tale because now I have a pretty different opinion on it. I would honestly say that if it, if at all possible for you to not live with your boyfriend or girlfriend before getting married, I would highly suggest that you continue living apart if you're not already living together and that is because how do I even get into this? <laughs> I feel like the Holy Spirit wants me to speak on this and just kind of share my experience, but I kind of don't know how because it's still actually pretty fresh for me. And that's why I think that I'm being called to talk about it because I am living in a new place and living on my own again for the first time in two years, two, two and a half years, roughly, something like that. But where I was living before was with my ex. Yes, I know, shocking, shocking confession. <laughs> yeah, this whole past year, while I had been making my videos about my journey into Christianity and all the things that I had been learning and discovering, I was living with my ex that whole time and kind of not really by choice because by the time that I had come into my faith, I was pretty quickly aware of the fact that the biblical perspective is that it's not right to cohabitate before marriage. So it's not like I was kind of under this 
false belief that whole time or, or, or if I was deluding myself. But because we had already kind of determined at that point that we probably were not going to be able to get married because we had differences of faith, he's Jewish, and from that point on, we remained platonic pretty much the rest of that entire year up until I had just left two weeks ago. So although we were not romantic, although we were not, you know, kind of TMI, but we were not being physical. So I knew that, okay, well, I'm not actively living in sin in that way, but I am still living with a man who I was dating and that I thought I was going to marry and I came into that relationship without Christian values, right? So it just kind of ended up being that way and again, I didn't have a conviction from the Holy Spirit yet because I had another six months from that point until I would encounter Christ. Which was a big point of contention for us when I first came into it because at first I was like, <laughs> do you know? That scene in Padre Pio, where Shia LaBeouf, who plays Padre Pio, is like, say Christ is Lord, say Christ is Lord, and it's like turned into a meme. That was me to him in the beginning. I was just so zealous, and I was like, I want you to be saved, and I want you to be saved. So yeah, we were living together while this was happening, and we were not romantic at this point already, and I already knew that I needed to move out at this point already. I just, I didn't have the means, I didn't have the ability to, and that's kind of a part of this cautionary tale that I guess I kind of want to share with you today because it's been kind of more normalized, I guess, in general Western society, this kind of idea of like being a stay-at-home girlfriend or you're kind of like playing house before you're actually married and you're kind of, especially for women, because for whatever reason, it just comes naturally to us, I think, to treat a boyfriend like a husband because for most of history there was no such thing as boyfriend there was no such thing as like situationship like maybe some people were having affairs on the side and they had mistresses and stuff but other than that it's it was really marriage or singleness and, and that was really what the situation was for women most of the time in general society up until maybe a hundred years ago in my in my limited historical understanding right and i think that's also why biblically speaking the bible doesn't specifically address living with a boyfriend or girlfriend because there was no boyfriend or girlfriend in biblical times and people were not living together out of wedlock they weren't living together outside of marriage a man and woman together unless they were family members but romantically people weren't shacking up before the wedding had taken place it was just i think that would have brought a lot of shame to people's families and and people were just a lot more communally involved in the kind of matchmaking and matrimonial process so that just like wasn't even a thing in biblical times and I remember very early on in my journey where we still, I think both had a little bit of hope that the other person would come around. And that's why, and that's why aside from the fact that I couldn't just up and leave right away because I had left my job and I had left where I was living and moved states to be with him, which I think I would recommend against that also, if you could help it. And that's a part of the story of why I'm trying to share this today. But. I was I was researching this a lot because I was trying to find out what do Christians tend to believe on this because it's not mentioned super directly in the Bible or super specifically. We do have plenty of examples in the Old Testament and in the New Testament of it being made clear that fornication, which is premarital sex, is a sin. We have that very clearly stated in the Bible, along with just general sexual immorality, right? So that's kind of where this purity culture in Christianity comes from. It's, it's, it stems from a very kind of real and understandable commandment that we have in the Bible contextually. It's not directly stated like this because it kind of doesn't need to be, but we see from Genesis that God made Adam and he made Eve from Adam's rib because he said it's not good for man to be alone. 
and let me create for you a companion, a help me, a helper. And so we fit perfectly together within marriage, right? And that's, that's kind of what we were designed for in terms of togetherness, right? Not every person is called to marriage, to having a family, and there are absolutely ways to serve outside of being a husband or a wife or mother or father. I mean, look at the priesthood, look at the religious sisters and brothers that we have, right? Even lay people who devote themselves to living a godly, holy, beautiful life. There are so many ways to be of service when you are not married. Do not get me wrong, I am not married right now. I'm fully in my in my single season right now and I'm for the first time in my life really kind of just basking in it a little bit, really kind of enjoying it and just feeling like it's just me and God right now and I really, I like it. Like it, it feels really good and I've never ever been that type of person before God. I always felt like, I needed a man like I really did kind of feel like that and you know you could chalk it up to having an absent father you could chalk it up to I'm just kind of a naturally romantic sort of girlfriend's person <laughs> I was a serial monogamist ever since I was 13 years old so there were only a few time periods in my life where I was truly single and most of those periods of time were within the era of COVID. I was in my apartment for the first time by myself in New York City, COVID's hitting, don't know what's going on. <laughs> and I, yeah, I was single for a good, maybe like two years during that period of time, maybe a little bit longer than that, maybe two or three years. So that was really the only like very significant part of my life that I was truly single. Like I would go out on dates and I was seeing, you know, a few people through that period of time kind of not super seriously, I guess you could say. But I always felt like finding the one, finding my husband was going to complete me, was going to save me. I think I was always looking for a savior, a man who would just, you know, kind of rescue me from the tower and just kind of make my whole life good and have meaning and have purpose and i think a lot of women feel like that and it's not like this totally off base deluded belief because i mean if your dream is to have a family you do need <laughs> a solid partner of the opposite sex to do so and i think as women we are wired towards that even if maybe for whatever reason you don't necessarily want that that's not your ideal or maybe you're not able to do that which is also okay like i said there's so many different ways to live a fulfilling and fruitful and holy and inspiring life in in this world so i don't want anyone to kind of feel bad when i'm discussing these sort of topics but yeah that's how i felt and then after encountering christ <laughs> and after giving my life to him and all of the time that I've spent just growing closer to God and reading the Bible and just trying to understand how he wants us to live and what does womanhood look like from a biblical perspective? What is femininity from a biblical perspective too? Because also before I came into Christianity, I was, I was like moving more towards embracing a more traditional feminine kind of life and way of being because I was coming out of a phase where by the end of my time living in New York City I had gotten used to for example dressing in a way that was pretty like masculine and pretty like edgy and just kind of a lot of black and like combat boots and stuff because I honestly felt like and this wasn't conscious this is kind of subconsciously how it started to portray itself outwardly I felt like I needed armor and I felt like I needed to kind of look tough to scare people off because I just had so many kind of honestly traumatic and scary and agitating and upsetting experiences just like walking the streets of New York City. And so by the end of it, I had this like, I had a guard up and that was like visible in the way that I even dressed. And so I started to kind of just feel this pull of like, I just, I kind of want to feel a little bit more feminine i want to look a little bit more feminine again because i think that is a little bit more true to my nature 
although I can be very tough and I can have these kind of more stereotypically masculine traits like if needed I can step up and lead I can be decisive I can be kind of direct like I have I have that ability in me but do I always want to utilize that um no I don't <laughs> I I don't because the more that I've embraced this kind of Christian virtue of attempting to have a gentle and quiet spirit it's there it's been in me this whole time it's just that I wasn't able to go about the world like that and feel safe at the same time so anyway I was kind of already moving towards this whole like femininity journey before I was ever a Christian like a few years before and being more curious about kind of understanding and attaining a more traditional life and I fell into the realms of the universe guru, Mina Irfan, if you're familiar with her work, Shira Seven, aka the Sprinkle Sprinkle Lady, that kind of stuff, which, yeah, they talk about femininity and traditional lifestyles and all that, but they're basically talking about it from a hypergamy standpoint. They're basically saying, be more feminine so that you can attract the most masculine man, which really means in their language, a wealthy man, basically. And a lot of their rhetoric is about marry for lifestyle and fall in love later. And so I was like, at this point, I was, I guess, probably 26-ish, something like that. At this point, I had, you know, I had dated for love. I had dated in the regular secular way. I had also dated in a kind of sugar baby way too. So I wasn't completely unfamiliar with that sort of concept and, and way of thinking, I guess you could say, unfortunately. But I was already in that kind of headspace and, and that was kind of familiar to me a little bit, even though I had had experiences in that world in particular where I felt like, yeah, I might be sitting in a five star resort in the Caribbean right now, drinking champagne and living what looks like a very luxurious life, but I would rather just be here with someone who truly understood me. I would give anything to be here with someone who just actually got me and, and loved me for who I actually am or for my heart, rather than just maybe how I make them look or how I make them feel. So I, I had learned that the hard way already that that was not something that was really truly sustainable, at least for me. I need depth and I need connection and I would in a heartbeat trade a billionaire who didn't have that for someone who maybe wasn't well off or maybe is still on their way, but just I truly connect with, you know. So I had already learned that by then, but I still kind of fell into their their ideologies because they're so convincing <laughs> and it makes so much sense and I think when you're starting to question the general secular rhetoric that we've grown up in in the 21st century especially as women where from a young age we were kind of subliminally taught you can do anything a man can do anything you could do I can do better sort of always trying to prove that you're not like the other girls and they you know these movies the cool girl, they always show this woman who's like unbelievably beautiful, but she still throws down like a six pack of beer and like hot dogs with you and your bros. And like, <laughs> she has like masculine interests, like Michaela and Transformers, Megan Fox and Transformers. Like she knows how to fix a car, but like looks super beautiful while doing it. All this sort of messaging gets into your head. And so even then beyond that, where we're encouraged, just like men have been traditionally encouraged to get an education and, and get a career going for yourself and have a stable living before you even think of having a family, right? That's been put onto women now too. So we have kind of been forced to take on a more masculine way of being in general in order to succeed and in order to kind of be respected in the general kind of populace as well like people will always ask you what do you do and so people will judge you based upon what your answer to that is and unfortunately in our current society it's it's not as prestigious to say for example that you're a housewife over you're a doctor right or something which we need both right <laughs> but that's just kind of the way that 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 is so i think that women have 
pretty much since birth, at least for millennials, with the exception of like Disney movies and that kind of traditional feminine desire of a Prince Charming finding you and saving you and whatever. Aside from that, a lot of the messaging we've received is being feminine is kind of lame and not cool. It's way cooler to be a masculine girl who's simultaneously really beautiful. That's, that's the dream, right? So yeah, you find women now in, in the dating space being confused because they're like, okay, well, I have a really successful career. I make a good living for myself. I've traveled the world. I've done all these things. And when I put that on my dating profile, men aren't interested. What's going on? And I think that's because although those things are great, it's great that as women, we have the ability to have that kind of independence for ourselves these days. Even our grandmothers barely had that, right? So it's, it's great, but at the same time, I think as women, we just have to understand that that's what we would be attracted to in a man. But <laughs> there's a reason why there's been this kind of trope of the successful man marrying the waitress he met one time or the cashier. It, it's never been as important for a woman to have a prestigious career historically. Only in the last, I don't know, maybe since the 80s has that been kind of a thing even. I mean, obviously in higher society, people who were well-born were expected to be well-educated and to kind of be well-rounded in a certain way. But it wasn't so that they could compete in the workforce is basically what I'm trying to say. So things have just been topsy-turvy on this front for a while now. And, you know, it goes both ways. Men also, there's kind of a little bit of a shortage or it seems like there's a shortage of just kind of genuine, masculine, godly men. I mean, they're out there for sure, but you don't encounter them every day, everywhere you go, and it's not their fault. There's a lot of cultural and environmental factors that are kind of fighting against that. So both, both sides have things to kind of be aware of and to work on, but yeah, so, even before I came to Christianity, I was very open to this kind of traditional, more feminine way of being, but I was really looking at it from a more hypergamous, kind of worldly perspective. So when I met my ex, even though we got along well and we had fun together and everything, it wasn't that we had such a deep connection like a mental, a, a deep mental connection that, you know, I just like instantly fell in love right away. It wasn't that, it was that he had built a pretty impressive life for himself being the age that he was and he was living a life that I thought that I really wanted, you know, having a homestead and a farm and a good amount of land. Like I had always dreamed about that and I admired him for building his life to that extent, especially coming from the background he comes from where nobody does that. It's not even like <laughs> he comes from the kind of secular or even Gentile world. In the Jewish community, people don't leave the community and they certainly don't move away from the community and, and like live on a bunch of land on a farm. Like that's, he's very unusual <laughs> and he was brave and courageous and he had woodworking skills and was in the military. So he had a lot of skills that I found to be very attractive. And I figured I could, I could build a life with this guy because he makes me feel safe. And although like, was he the best listener ever? Were we having the most amazing deep conversations? Not really. But I thought, you know, I was following that advice of like, okay, well, marry for lifestyle and fall in love later. It's kind of more Eastern idea of, oh, people get arranged over there all the time and they fall in love over time and only the West thinks that's super weird or whatever. If you're familiar with Nina Irfan's work, that's like a big part of her messaging. So I was like deep into that at that point. I was like, okay, yeah, I mean, that, that makes sense. But once I got to a point of realizing that it just, again, I can't, I kind of came back to the same place I had come to a few years earlier, you know, on that Caribbean resort, I realized, yeah, you know, I might be in a beautiful space and there might be a lot of perks to being with this person, but I I don't feel seen and I don't feel heard. Like I didn't necessarily feel like he truly cared about me as a person, which if you're watching this, I'm sorry. I'm not trying to be mean. 
Um, I know that he does care about me as a person because he went out of his way to show me that in different ways and in, in a way that he felt he could show me that. But I just, I love a good deep conversation and I connect through kind of, I connect verbally, I think. So, so yeah, just that aspect of things was missing. And so I knew even outside of the whole religious stuff that, I mean, could I really live my whole life without that, even having these other perks? So that's when I really got to a point of just utter despair because at this point in time, I was still in a headspace of thinking kind of subconsciously, but also kind of consciously that finding the right man will save me and becoming a wife and a mom is like that, that's what'll really fulfill me, which is again, not this like outlandish idea, but it's, it's never good to put your happiness in someone else's hands or to put kind of your status in the world as your meaning or fulfillment. Because as women, I think it's true that in society, unfortunately, you do get a little bit more respect and kind of less questioning if you're married. And I'm saying this as a single woman, but I, I do notice that just all the different jobs I've worked and all the different places I've lived and just the life I've lived so far, I'm still relatively young, but, but yeah, you get like a certain kind of respect and it, it almost feels like as a woman, like, phew, I've got the ring, like, I'm good, I don't need to worry about that anymore. Because we also have this biological clock aspect too that gives us this kind of internal sort of urgency that men just don't have. So there's a lot of reasons for that and there's cultural and societal reasons for that too and it's kind of unfortunate and it's kind of makes sense and it's also kind of changing but it depends on what circles you're in right so i was in a headspace where i just i just wanted that part of my life to be secure i didn't want to date anymore i didn't want to have to worry about finding the one anymore <laughs> i just and i also i didn't want to have to keep working in the traditional way anymore because at that point in time even though i was actually working a job that i really liked at the time that i met him and i left that job to go be with him which again i don't recommend doing and that's something that i have taken away from that experience i think permanently is as a woman it is always wise to have your own money it doesn't mean that you need to stay working this high power job while you're married while you have kids like if if you honestly in my opinion marry well which means you marry a man who understands that most of the time a woman flourishes when she's given the choice so that doesn't mean only look for men that only want a trad wife right because that can actually kind of be a little bit of a red flag too even as a traditional kind of marriage-minded biblical woman it's still kind of a little bit of a red flag if a man is like, I only want my woman to stay at home. I only want her to be a housewife and baking bread and stuff. It's like, I think that's nice if you're cool with that, but if that's the only thing you're gonna allow her to do, <laughs> that can get really dicey because it might sound really idyllic to be in that situation, especially if you've been working for a little bit and you're kind of tired of the grind and you're just like, man, it would be nice to just be able to stay home and, and cook and clean, right? I've lived that life and that's the life that I was pretty much living for the last year. I just never really shared that part or, or kind of, I wasn't ready to share it because I was still in it and I knew that it was not, it was not fully what, God would want for me because that man was not and is not my husband and I knew that he was probably never going to be. So although I was not sharing my body with him because I I knew that okay like that's that's where things get too confusing because when we share our body with somebody as women our brain releases oxytocin which is the same chemical that's released when you have a baby and your brain automatically wants to bond you to that child, right? So that is the bonding hormone. That's what our brain does when we share ourselves with a man, right? For men, they release a different kind of cocktail of, of chemicals, but it's not oxytocin. They don't get the bonding hormone when that happens. Maybe they do mentally or something. I don't know, I'm not a man but uh, just kind of biologically speaking, that's not what's happening. So 
As women, when we do that willy-nilly, it's traumatic for us, honestly, whether you're kind of aware of that or not. It's, it's just not good for us mentally, physically, spiritually. I really do think at this point there is a reason that God designed it the way he did where yes, our bodies are capable of that. Our bodies are capable of creating life, which is the purpose of sex. <laughs> it's not just for funsies. Like the purpose is procreation really and bonding with your spouse because once you are married, that is a covenant that you have entered into now between you, your spouse and God. And before I was a Christian, I never fully understood the kind of seriousness of marriage, like I was definitely the sort of person where I was nearly engaged almost twice, like had a ring picked out and everything. I didn't go through with it because like something in, in me was telling me just not to, even though again, I thought like being married was gonna save me, but something was still telling me not to do it. And then when I became a Christian, I realized, wow, it is so serious <laughs> to be in, sacred matrimony with somebody till death do us part there's a reason why that's in the vows and that's still in many secular people's vows despite them not adhering to christianity or religion anymore so yeah like i was definitely the sort of girl who would have gotten married in vegas and like oh if we work out we work out and like if we get divorced it's whatever but now i'm just like yeah no if i get married i I'm hoping and praying that that's for life. Unless the worst circumstances were to befall me, divorce is almost really not even on the table at all. So I'm just glad that I never kind of got into that sort of bond with anybody, even though living a secular life and long-term relationships, it almost feels like it's the same thing, but it's really not. It's really not because even just from a legal perspective, if you're with somebody for years and you've you've given them so much of your time and your your effort and your your being and they just up and leave one day and maybe you you did not kind of secure yourself yourself financially or just in in many different ways you can kind of just rely on someone else and then one day they just up and leave there's no sort of protection for you set up in our society you're just kind of left in the wind so you do see a lot of women older women who lived that trad wife life just kind of just kind of sharing their stories a little bit with that not to scare young women because i think that it really is a beautiful and very kind of it's a very god honoring way to live your life as a woman if if god calls you into marriage to devote yourself to to being of service to your family and to raise up godly children and to create a happy and healthy and warm and beautiful home <laughs> like that's that's amazing i feel like that would be very heartwarming like my heart is warm just thinking about it right but not everybody is called to that and there are pros to not being called to that because just like that sounds so idyllic and beautiful and cozy right and we see all these beautiful images on Pinterest of these like perfectly coiffed women in beautiful outfits holding a baby that has like no spit up on it <laughs> and like the house is spotless. Um, the reality of that, I mean, as I said, I have not been married. I do not have any children, but I have played wife more than a few times, but significantly in the last year, that was pretty much the way that I contributed to the household was kind of taking care of the meals and keeping the house clean. And even when you just have one more adult person there, plus pets, <laughs> which pets are not children, but they do make messes. You do have to clean a lot more. If you're a woman who's ever lived with a man, you know that for whatever reason, things just get way dirtier, way faster. And there's just, there's a lot more workload there going on. I think there's some kind of study or statistic that when a woman gets married, her day-to-day -day workload of like the household domestic chores increases by seven hours per day, which sounds insane. Like it sounds like they're kind of exaggerating, but that was actually the reality for me when I played wife, even though I did not even have children. So I don't even like, if you have kids, I don't even know. <laughs> Either you have the heart and patience of a saint and you're just or you're just like fully devoted and you realize that God has called you to this and that is a very honorable and completely viable way 
to honor God as a woman through your family and through taking care of your home and your husband and everything. But yeah, it's not like this super idyllic, perfect, like, I mean, especially if a lot of, a lot of women these days, because we've kind of instituted this like nuclear, nuclear, nuclear family dynamic where a lot of families are pretty isolated and we've lost touch with this more like communal aspect of having a village a lot of people unfortunately these days don't really have a village and i mean even for me in this kind of play pretend situation that i was in which i in a perfect world i wish i had never done all these things but at the same time it's given me so much insight into what it would actually be like like just a little sneak peek and it's given me insight into what I am suited to and maybe what I'm not as suited to before I actually settle down somewhere and, and really kind of enter into marriage if I'm called to do so, right? So it's, it's been pretty valuable. I think, yeah, in a perfect world, you know, I would have been raised with Christian values and, and would have saved myself for marriage from the very start and probably would have gotten married young and had a lot of kids already by now. Like, that sounds really nice, but God, had a different plan for me and he has a plan for you too so if yours doesn't look like that cookie cutter everything's already sorted out by the time you're 22 like i get it when i see people like that i'm like god bless you that's beautiful and also i feel like oh man i kind of wish that was me because when i was in my early 20s i was in a relationship where i was incredibly in love and and so happy and we wanted to do that but God has a plan because although we were so in love and we got along so well, when it really got down to it, we had a different vision for life and we had kind of different values. So yeah, you can have chemistry, but it's different than having compatibility for a lifelong marriage. So that partner and I, that boyfriend and I, we would have divorced if we would have gotten married, especially because as far as I know, he is not a Christian. He wasn't a Christian then, although he was the first person to bring the Holy Bible into my space ever. <laughs> and I kept that Bible with me in quite a few moves going forward. And I used it as decor. <laughs> like I never cracked it open, but I felt a lot of reverence and respect towards it. And it made me feel good just like having it around. Even before I was a Christian, before I understood anything about really God or Christianity or anything, I had a Bible and I had a cross that I brought with me from place to place and yeah I've just been I've been clearing through a lot of my camera roll lately because I can finally face my past a little bit I kind of wasn't able to even bear looking at old pictures before and just I know I'm going on a lot of tangents here but just even looking at the before and after I mean you could see it in my eyes just like what a hold the enemy had on me and I was living so deeply in sin, not even aware of it. But the craziest thing, and like this is what gives me chills, is like there are so many glimmers of God's presence that was still there with me during all of that, when he could have easily turned from me and let me just kind of go straight on the road, the highway to hell, right? He could have just let me go down that road and that's where I was headed, right? But I, I loved imagery of the cross and I loved imagery of the church, even though I was into this new age, spirituality, Easter and occult, witchcrafty stuff, I still kept a cross on my coffee table, I still prayed with it, I lived right next to a Catholic church, I would hear the bells chime, whenever I would walk around the city and I would see like a cross or an angel or something, I would always stop and take a, a photo of it. Like I said, I had that Bible that I brought with me everywhere and he was always just chasing after me and when i look back on it it's sad to see kind of the level of just how lost i was and you could see it in my eyes that i'm just like searching and kind of sad even in the most like happy fun moments and i was i really was searching and i really just i wanted to know why we were here like what was the meaning of this because most of life just kind of felt like suffering to me and suffering without meaning is hell i mean really so just looking back and seeing that he was there that whole time and when I finally kind of, I don't know if I've fully come into communion with him yet actually because I am starting to increasingly believe that the Catholic Church really is the true church and I am not yet in communion with the church. But <laughs> even as it stands now where I've given my life to Christ and I've 
been on this road for the last year, just the difference in, uh, you can just see it visibly in, in somebody's eyes and in their kind of lightness and the journey that I've been on with modesty and just kind of wanting to honor God visibly and the way that I speak and the way that I try to relay things without being vulgar or crass, <laughs> it just kind of happened naturally. But when I look back, that wasn't at all the way that I was really. So there's just so many changes that God can do in your heart once you let him in. I think I mentioned that in almost every video and I always get into that <laughs> in like every video, but I'm just, I'm just so grateful. So, so yeah. Everything kind of works out in its perfect timing, I think, and I've just found myself here feeling content and at peace and relaxed and not worried, which is not something that I've really ever felt before having God. <laughs> and I said that in my last video when I was preparing to move here that I just, I didn't feel worried. I didn't feel scared. I didn't feel anxious on the drive down here i did like as i started getting closer i did start getting really scared because i was like oh my gosh i've never been here like what am i doing this is crazy <laughs> and the first night i was kind of just like okay where am i i felt exactly like my two cats where you know you place them in a new environment and they're like okay i'm gonna hide under the bed for a little while and just gather myself so that's how i felt but as the days went on i was just like wow this truly only could have been God because I didn't need all of those things that you usually need to move like a good credit score and all your bank statements and all your ducks in a row and first last and security and all of that that was so distressing for me while living with an ex knowing that I needed to move but I had put myself in a disadvantageous disadvantageous I had put myself in a, in a, a bad spot where I just didn't have the ability and I felt trapped and I felt stuck. And now because of that, also I have to say that I have a lot of compassion and I have a lot more understanding towards women who genuinely do get trapped in kind of not so great situations. I have a lot more empathy for them because yeah, I think if you've never experienced something kind of similar to that, it can seem like just leave. Like, what do you mean? If you're not in a good situation with someone, just leave. It's not always that simple, especially if you have kind of made yourself financially vulnerable in that way. So, so yeah, I think to kind of wrap that up, <laughs> what I've taken away from these experiences is that I think there is a good reason why God has kind of created a structure for us in marriage and outside of marriage it's just not his design for us to be living as if we are and there are just so many things that come about when you are going against his natural design in that way that can really hurt you and can really hurt your boyfriend and girlfriend as well because at the end of the day i think I think honestly, in my experience, and I could be wrong, but like generally speaking, by a year, you probably know if you could marry this person or not. By three months is when you start to see someone's true colors. So that's just something that I've learned that experts tend to state as well, that by three months, if somebody has a kind of facade going on, they can't really keep it up after that point. So if you are dating and if you are dating for marriage, I think that's just good to keep in mind. Like definitely don't, if you can help it, at least for me, <laughs> I don't think I'm ever going to, you know, jump into something or marry someone before knowing them for three months, which is something I almost did in my last relationship, believe it or not. And I'm really glad that I did it. And my mom in particular was like, there's no need to rush. Like, don't do that. And I was like, okay. But yeah, I'm really glad that I, I didn't and I kind of waited because things did change after that point and after six months and at a year, it was pretty clear how we can move forward and in our case, we couldn't move forward. So I just kind of had closure with that. I was ready to kind of make this leap. I knew that there was no reason for me to stay there anymore and I knew that 
even though I wasn't being physical with this man, I still kind of felt like because we had dated, because we had been together in that way, it still kind of felt like I was living in sin, even if it wasn't like active sin, if that makes sense. And, and I knew that just living with a man in general, as, as a woman who is pursuing holiness and pursuing being a true, genuine <laughs> woman of God, I knew that that really didn't make sense. It didn't really go together. So, by the time that I was finally just ready, well, actually what had happened was, I guess I'm just getting really real with you guys here <laughs> because I feel like it could help somebody else in a similar position. And the reason why I share this too is because I just feel like people don't usually share this part of things because it's kind of embarrassing, but I don't really have anything to lose by sharing it. And if it could help somebody, and glorify God and honor him in the process, then there's only things to be gained, right? So I had asked God, okay, because there was also a little part of me that wasn't sure why he was keeping me there because sometimes my, my ex would show signs of being more open towards Christ and asking me questions and I had caught him watching sermons <laughs> a few times. So I was like, God, are you using me? to bring him to Christ like I, I wasn't sure so I was just kind of like okay if, if that's what it is like I don't know I've I've heard I know you can do amazing things there's nothing too big for you and I've heard stories of people who yeah they were they were saved and then their their boyfriend or girlfriend or fiance was not and then eventually they came around and so I've heard stories of that so I was like I don't know maybe maybe that's in the cards I don't know by the end of September I was like okay God, what do you want me to do? Do you want me to stay here? Are you using me to bring this man to Christ? Or do you want me to leave? And if you want me to leave, send me a sign and a clear way to do so. Because it's not, it's not that obvious as to how or like where I should go. So a few days later, <laughs> my ex and I had gotten into a fight the night before and you know, I went, I had my own bedroom there, so I went to sleep, I didn't see him. And then I woke up and I came out of my bedroom into the kitchen and all of my suitcases had been placed there, empty. He didn't like pack up all my stuff, but he just put my all my suitcases there and left for the day. And at first, like my first instinct was like, oh, I wanna fight back, like how dare he? But then I quickly realized, oh, I had asked God for a sign. And this is like pretty visually clear. <laughs> like, here are your suitcases, girl. Time to head on out. So I was like, okay. So I, I reached out to my friend who, who lives down here in the state that I'm at now. And I let them know like, okay, I think, I think I'm ready. I think I'm gonna, you know, try to pursue that offer and, and just try to make it work. And from there, the ball just got rolling and, and here I am. So, <laughs> so yeah, I had asked God for a sign and I felt like, okay, that was, that was pretty visually clear. But anyway, yeah, I don't know. I, I just felt really called to kind of share my experiences with living with a boyfriend before marriage and, and why I wouldn't recommend it, honestly, why I would recommend if you are dating, especially if you're dating for marriage, especially if you are hoping to have a godly marriage one day, I really do think it's best to just live apart until you are married because that's just the way that God designed it to be because there is too much temptation when you are living together to kind of push that line or to go over the line. And I know people in secular society these days would probably not fully understand, you know, what's wrong with that or kind of have some pushback about that. but. From a biblical perspective, there is a reason why God designed sex <laughs> to be between husband and wife because then, first of all, you are bonding with somebody who has already committed to you for life and they have claimed you and they hopefully, you know, make you feel safe and protected and the purpose of intimacy for human beings is procreation. So if you are married, you don't need to be hopefully 
worried about STDs, you don't need to be worried about getting pregnant, you can be open to life and that is the way that God intended it to be. And when you are outside of marriage, you, first of all, can't fully 100% know what somebody's up to either way, unfortunately, but I think the chances of something outside of the relationship happening when you're not married is probably a little bit higher just because like the stakes are a little bit lower like each person could leave a lot more easily and so that gives you a little bit less incentive to maybe work things out when things are getting challenging and outside of it there's just so much more confusion with that there's so much more just a lack of security and trust and just kind of this this deep feeling of safety that I think as women is necessary for us really. So I really recommend if you are not married I and you are pursuing the path of holiness, I really recommend committing to celibacy, honestly, because there is a reason that sexual immorality and fornication is mentioned so much in the Bible as just not being the behavior of saints essentially because it does open you up to a different kind of headspace that is not really helpful for you outside of marriage and so that's kind of where i'm at at this point i really don't plan on getting into any kind of physical relationship again outside of marriage and if god never called me to marriage then that's that. <laughs> it's, it's not something we need. That's something that secular society has convinced us of that you need it. It's healthy and this and that. It's healthy within marriage, but outside of it, you can definitely live without it. And I think it just clouds your judgment and it, it just changes your, your state of mind. And it tricks your body also as a woman to bonding with somebody who you are not in that kind of covenant with. So it's you don't have that safety and security. And it's just, I just, I just don't recommend it. I don't think it's helpful for us. I don't think it's wise. And yeah, I'm sure that there's men out there who could share their perspective on that. But I'm speaking as a woman and I'm speaking mostly to women. All right, my storage is basically full and I'm deleting apps <laughs> just to finish up this video. So anyway, I hope that means that I've gotten everything I wanted to share into this video for you guys. And if I missed anything or if you have some insights or experience with this that you would be comfortable and open to sharing in the comments, please do. I think it's always so valuable to get a kind of variation of perspectives and opinions on a topic that is kind of as taboo and also important as this one. So. I think that's it for me today in my new space. Yay, God is so good. <laughs> Thank you guys for watching and following along with my journey. And I will catch you in the next one. All right.